So the first talk's more an introduction and kind of partly to say why I've chosen to offer these talks about Bodhidharma. Um, I, I know there are a number of trainees, monastic and probably more so lay, who have a particular attraction to Bodhidharma and his teachings. Um, and I seem to have come to share that sense of him but at first somehow more circumspectly. I don't think we've done an awful lot on him here at, at Throstle, even with a master. Um, and this may on my part be a general questioning of what it is to be a monk and how we conduct ourselves as monks of the OBC. Nowadays, I dare to question some of our rites and rituals and whether they do help us to live our lives as fully as any human being can do so. Well, how do we live our lives most fully so that we really know in a way that is beyond belief that we all have the potential to become Buddha? Maybe this is the essence of any spiritual life, you know, of any religion, even people who aren't necessarily belonging to a religion. Um, but I, for us, it's the potential to become a Buddha, that's how we would describe it. Um, and nowadays I've come to love and respect Bodhidharma's rather iconoclastic approach and to smile at the legends that abound around his life and death. How much is fantasy? How much is weaving an intriguing story? How much is verifiable fact at this distance of many centuries later? So let's set the scene with some historical, in inverted commas, facts. Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma, is our 28th ancestor, as Mahakasho is considered the first ancestor. Look at the Denkaroka and you'll see that. And Bodhidharma is also thought of as the first Zen ancestor in our ancestral line. Why is he called the first ancestor of Zen? Given that there were so-called Zen masters in China before he arrived? I'll return to this question in due course. The description of his life has many aberrations, maybe variations is a somewhat politer way to say it. It helps to see the somewhat different descriptions of his life as an inevitability, as they are more like hagiographies i.e. descriptions of the life of a saint, rather than accurate bi uh, biographies. He was the subject of many legends, no doubt you're probably all aware of them. Along with Zen and Kung Fu, he reportedly brought tea to China. And the story is, to keep from falling asleep while meditating, he cut off his eyelids, and where they fell, tea bushes grew. And whether he did actually cut off his eyelids or he had some eye disease meant he had bulging eyes is also in question. But you, I'm sure, seen the descriptions and seen the drawings and paintings or sculpture of a monk with bulging, lidless eyes. So Buddhism came to China 2,000 years ago. Since then, hundreds of Indian and Central Asian monks have journeyed to China by land and sea. But among those who brought the teaching of Buddha to China, none has had the impact comparable to that of Bodhidharma. He was born in the late 5th or early 6th century in southern India the third son of a local monarch of the warrior caste. His father, King Koshi, 
had a reverence for Buddhism. And you can read the description of King Koshi's, King Koshi's three sons in the Dinka Rocco and how Hanyatara became Bodhidharma's master. Um, well, the king tested the spiritual wisdom of the three princes by showing them a priceless pearl and asking, can anyone, anything rival this pearl? Hearing Bodhidharma's eloquent response, Anyatara knew that Bodhidharma was karmically descended from a sage. Yet still, Anyatara held back for a while before he accepted Bodhidharma as his disciple. He was his disciple for 40 years. When the master died, he was approaching his 60s. This is Bodhidharma. He knew his karmic connection with China had ripened and sailed for three years, crossing the southern sea to arrive at Nankai, where the well-known audience of Emperor Wu took place. I'll just repeat it because I think it's well worth listening to again. Emperor Wu is portrayed as a devout, pious Buddhist, intent on gaining merit through good works. He told Bodhidharma that he'd been working very hard to establish Buddhism in China. Then he asked how much merit he would have earned. Bodhidharma replied, none whatsoever. A pretty bold statement because emperors were very, very powerful. They could chop off your head before you thought twice about it. Now this first teaching of Bodhidharma was that all deeds are empty because they're devoid of meaning, because nothing is fixed and separate. It's all very fluid. And he sought to turn the emperor's attention away from spiritual success to an understanding of emptiness. As you probably know, the Chinese word is wu and the Japanese mu. This is for emptiness. And empty doesn't mean nothing. A fullness, there is a fullness in emptiness because everything is connected. All our thoughts, opinions and experiences come from our interaction with everything else. My views are just collection of other views that I've heard about. Views are not a problem. The problem is that we live our lives on the basis of attachment to an ingrained assumption and identity, namely that we possess a permanent I, capital letters I, me. We may think we know ourselves and others, but really, do we? Because of our rigid assumptions, we categorize things in terms of good and bad. And to be honest, specifically things that are good or bad for me. In responding, none whatsoever, Bodhidharma attempts to subvert the emperor's religious piety, leaving him with nowhere to stand and nothing to grasp. The story I found leads me to consider whether I'm a pious being. Am I a pious being at all? And sometimes the answer is probably not. And I feel somewhat embarrassed to say this, but not ashamed. Why not ashamed? I think it might be that Instead of piety, I touch a deep sincerity within in trying to follow the path, and not for my gratification, but also trusting it can help others to find their own individual ways in this human life. And I have a sense of a real wish to know the truth. So as you know, the Emperor's second question was, who is facing me? And Bodhidharma replied, I don't know. You can imagine that 
was <laughs> didn't perhaps go down terribly well with the emperor. His replies were quite provocative, deliberately so, I imagine, because they are a challenge to let go of consoling beliefs and dwell in the unknowing perplexity of emptiness. Isn't this a grave challenge for all of us? Can we let go of consoling beliefs and dwell in the perplexity of emptiness? And I find some days this can feel more challenging than I can bear. And I find myself longing for ease, for death. This comes from a Keats poem. But this is familiar territory. And from time to time, <clears throat> I'm drawn back to the memory of a three-month winter retreat at the Hermitage. I did not turn to Reverend Master Dyson for help. Why? Was it a sort of obstinacy? Or I think really what it was was a vivid sense that only I could find my way. But somehow the master must have sensed the struggle because he sent me an encouraging card about finding the way in the echo chamber of the mind. And this helped me a great deal to investigate the nature of my own immediate experience and to investigate questions about training that arose from me. I tried to find that card recently and it's lost. It's funny how things you value are lost often or not. Um, so one of the question was, is monasticism really the path for me? And I hope all of you at times have to answer that for yourselves. If I stepped out of monastic life, would this take away the pain and confusion? I knew that wasn't going to be the case. Um, so I tried another tack. I found myself looking to death as the way out. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was drawn to reread Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, where he describes being half in love with easeful death. Finally, at last, at last, I stopped trying to do dodge the pain. I knew, this is inverted commas, that sort of a knowing, that there was no way out. Nothing to do but sit as still with the feelings and thoughts as I could manage at each and every moment. And I found <coughs> these words of Shantideva's. And Shantideva, rather like Bodhidharma, like Hui Neng, were quite unusual sort of monks. I think Shantideva, you've probably read A Guide to the Bodhisattva's Life. If not, please read it. It's a very good book. I'm sure we've got it here. And, you know, in the end, he stopped being a monk. He became a, a I don't know, all sorts of things. And, an official kind of guard outside one of the emperor's palaces. He lived as a courtesan. He, he did just kind of ordinary things, but that is a very fine book he wrote. And the lifeline I found in this was he's, he wrote, I should dispel the pain of others because it hurts like my own. And I should be good to them because they feel just as I do. When both they and I are the same in wanting joy and not desiring pain, what is so special about me? It was at this stage when I decided I wasn't going to stop being a monk and I hardly knew how to kill myself anyway, that the friendship with the neighbors at Kenya came into being. And this loving connection has endured 
even though nowadays I rarely see them. There was something extraordinary about, as a monk, making friends with ordinary people in the world who weren't Buddhists, who weren't part of our Sangha. And, you know, they did things that I don't know how they felt about it now, but they asked me if I would um, do something for their daughters. This was not Margaret and Peter, but these were grandchildren, a kind of ceremony for them, inviting them into the Buddhist life. But I did it, although I kind of knew that wasn't going to happen. And, you know, if, if they took me shopping, we went out for a meal at Morrison's, then they would insist we had to say the mealtime verse <laughs> and all make gush of you should have seen some of the looks from the people serving in the Morrison's Cafe, but they wanted it, so I guess, you know, they are very good friends to me, and I am very grateful for how they helped me be there. So, after his encounter with Emperor Wu, Bodhidharma recalled Hanyatara's words, Do not abide in the south. So he went north. It is said by literal-minded people that he floated there on a reed. And you've probably seen drawings of him floating on a reed. In fact, a reed is the name for a small passenger boat, so-called because of its shape. It's not an actual reed. But you can see how these myths you know, just abound over people. And he made his way to Mount Sung, where an emperor had constructed Shaolin Temple. Some accounts say he stayed in the monastery's east gallery. Others say that he spent nine months, nine years, facing the rock wall of a cave about a mile from the temple. But basically no one could fathom what he was doing when he sat cross-legged throughout the day facing the wall. And as a consequence, they called him the Brahmin who contemplates the wall, because clearly he wasn't Chinese, he was Indian. And what we recite in Rules for Meditation, although Bodhidharma transmitted the Buddha mind, we still hear the echoes of his nine years facing a wall. How blessed we are to have him as an ancestor. It's interesting that Bodhidharma had few disciples, the most prominent being Taizo Eka, Huiko in Chinese, to whom he entrusted his robe and bowl, and it is said by some the Lankavatara Sutra. And was this the case? Others wonder as Bodhidharma in his teaching mostly quotes from the Nirvana, the Avatamsaka, and the Vimalakirti Sutra. So perhaps it was times of Eka, not Bodhidharma, who thought so highly of the Lankavatara. And, you know, legends arise, myths arise. And we're probably really not going to know, and does that actually matter? So here's another example of Bodhidharma's teaching. Legend has it that when Taizo Eka first sought out Bodhidharma for his teaching, he said, I'm here to receive your teachings. I seek the Dharma. Bodhidharma's terse response was, Dharma, I have nothing to teach you. I have nothing to say. Taizo Eka wasn't put off, but said, But my mind is not at ease. Please pacify it for me. Before becoming a monk, Taizo Eka <clears throat> had been an army general who killed many people. So dis-ease and guilt no doubt weighed heavily upon him. Bodhidharma, bring me your mind and I will pacify it. Taizo Eka, I cannot find my mind. Bodhidharma, then I have already pacified it. So let's look at another mystery, and that's Bodhidharma's death. Was it true that he was poisoned by a jealous monk? 
were his remains interred at a temple on Bear Air, Air Mountain? Or was it true that three years after his reported death, he was said to be seen walking in the mountains of Central Asia, carrying a staff from which hung a single sandal? This rendition of his life says that he was returning to India. So how the story continues is that his tomb was opened and all that was found was a single sandal. Only somebody who so caught the imagination of many would have such fables surrounding them. The question arises then, why is he the most famous of the millions of monks who studied and taught the Dharma in China? Why is he alone credited with bringing Zen to China? Chinese monks may say that Zen Chan had been taught and practiced for several hundreds of years before the Bodhidharma arrived. Much of what he said about the doctrine has been said before. However, his approach was unique. Here is a flavor of what he said. Seeing your nature is Zen. Not thinking about anything is Zen. Everything you do is Zen. He did not view Zen as purification of the mind or as a stage on the way to Buddhahood. He equated Zen with Buddhahood and Buddhahood with the mind, the everyday mind. Instead of telling his disciples to purify their minds, he pointed them to rock walls. Bodhidharma Zen was Mahayana Zen, not Hinayana. He used the sword of wisdom to cut people's minds free from rules and scriptures. Such a sword is hard to grasp and hard to use. He referred back to Buddha Shakyamuni, who transmitted Zen with a flower to Makakasho, who received it with a smile. One thing is clear. His approach revolutionized the understanding and practice of Buddhism in China. It has been described as bare bones in. More of this in future talks, we will look for the print of the mind in his sermons. Just some historical background. An important interpretation of Bodhidharma's historical significance is that he symbolized resistance to the politicization of Buddhism in China. Buddhist emperors, of whom Emperor Wu was one of many, used the symbols and doctrines of the religion to enhance and legitimize their political view, rule. Of course, the emperors who used Buddhism in this way did not always do so cynically. Emperor Wu, for example, appears to have embraced the religion on a deep personal level. Nevertheless, the politicization and resultant degradation of Buddhism, especially the home-leaving ideal, led Buddhism to become a component of East Asian political ideology and a foundation of state power. And this was done as follows. Emphasis on the Bodhisattva path, that sounds wonderful, but that exalted non-home leavers and denigrated the original world-leaving ideal espoused by the historical Buddha. Monks leave home. And the state took control of the precepts and ordination ceremonies. And emperors had an interest in limiting the total number of home-leaving monks. For monks were not subject to taxation, military service or conscripted labor. So emperors established 
stringent intellectual and other requirements to limit the number of home leavers. And emperors were not keen to fund the construction of monasteries. As for the monks, the icy winters in China meant they needed permanent and sturdy housing. So this required an abbot who, fa who was favoured by the emperor. And then the empress had the right to select the abbot and decide what teachings he could give. Thus much of Buddhism became imperial in nature. And an emperor who supported a monastery also had the right to select what teachings should be translated I was inclined to approve works that he felt tended to exalt his position and prerogatives. So, no wonder Bodhidharma purposefully avoided emperors and their courts. He lived not far from Emperor Wu's court for an extended period of time, yet he avoided going to the court. Other Zen masters were the same. A good example is Dai Doshin, the 31st ancestor in our ancestral line. His story is that emperor in the Tang dynasty was drawn to the practical approach of Doshin's teaching and desired to pay his respects to Doshin in person, so he summoned him to the capital. Doshin humbly declined pleading illness. And with the fourth summons, the emperor commanded his emissary to bring back Doshin's head, if the monk really would not come. When the emissary reached the mountain and made known the emperor's instructions, Doshin, with great dignity, stretched out his neck to receive the blade. Finding this behavior extraordinary, the emissary returned to report what had happened and this only increased the emperor's admiration for Doshin. And he sent the monk a gift of rare silks. I think that was often the way that they made offerings to somebody. And then he just left him to his own resources. So it wasn't easy being a monk in those days. And here now, in what we hope will go on being a democracy, it's not so bad for us. But if you look back in our history at other religions that fight the thing of a Catholicism for interest, it was dangerous being a religious. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Doshin is that he adopted farming as a means of survival, independent of imperial sponsorship. And this was despite the fact that farming violated the traditional precepts against monks doing manual work or taking life, such as earthworms and pests that are unavoidably killed in the process of cultivation and food preparation. Um, <coughs> this led me to ponder how much do we pay attention to how the food gets on our plates do we really, each time we say it, take on board, thinking deeply of the ways and means by which this food has come? Probably not every time, but any time we do stop and speak sincerely, rather than as rote, it will make a difference and gratitude will be able to flow. The lifestyle of Doshin and his community were codified by Bei Zhang, who established the early set of pure rules for Chan or Zen monastic life, which allowed Chinese Zen to adopt the work, the work ethic in order to survive. These rules <coughs> These rules codified lifestyle as well as how Zen monasteries should be built. It was Bai Zhang who said, a day without work is a day without food. 
and I like the story very much. When he became um, an old man, he insisted on working, and in concern for his health, his monks hid his tools. So he stopped eating, and they were even more concerned. Uh, he explained with these words, a day without work is a day without food, and his tools were returned to him. Of course, Chinese Zen dealt with many problems unique to China. And one of these was maintaining the home-leaving ideal in a society where family was paramount, or where the physical act of leaving home and entering hostile natural environment required not only determination, but some external support and organization. For a certain period, the Southern School of Zen, which is um, linked to Daikon Eno Hui Ning, successfully avoided direct control by Imperial Way Buddhism, whereas the Northern School did not. And Buddhism was extraordinary because he seemed not to be interested in sutras. Because such literature tended to cause people to reify Buddhist concepts, such as emptiness, Buddha nature, etc. And yet he quotes a lot from sutras. So, you know, we have to make up our own minds. It's neither this nor that. But may, m mostly it turned against sutras because of their strong association with an exploitation by imperial way Buddhism. And what emperors would do would claim to be bodhisattvas, or incarnations of the Tathagata. And in that way, they endeavored to be the head of the church and thus maintain political control of Buddhism and its anti-worldly tendencies. I'm just thinking for a moment of Japan, the antagonism between the country's Zen tradition and the throne was less obvious. The Dogen is an example of a rejection of politics. And during the Meiji period of the late 19th century, the Japanese government chained Japan's Buddhists to the rise of the modern state. Monks were permitted to marry, and that was part of the plan. And I think it wasn't until Manzan that that was reversed. So that's kind of all for today. It just seemed a good idea to set the tone and the, and the history and the myths um, that arose around Bodhidharma. I think probably this is one of the shorter ones. The next one is um, the two entries in the four practices that I expect some of you, certainly Chasta, I can remember a number of monks talking about that when I was there for a year. Um, and then the others are um, well, the three of his sermons, the last one I won't deal with because we've already got it in our litany books um, and we sing it when there's a Bodhidharma festival. <laughs>